Hey guys, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours, and this is your Monday Minutes. Today, going to talk a little bit about uh, pediatric and respiratory assessment for the pediatric patient. Now, this is just a quick Monday Minutes here. I'm not going to go into all of the different disease processes and lung sounds and things like that. I think I'll save that for another episode, but what I want to do is just try to talk a little bit about your assessment approach and how you can do things to sort of make it a quick evaluation and using that sort of systematic approach to pediatric assessment um, when you evaluate a patient who might be seriously ill or maybe even an injured uh, pediatric with a respiratory problem. And what you want to do in this, this sort of thing is to look and listen for signs of respiratory distress or failure in sort of your initial quick uh, visual and um, auditory evaluation of the patient, right? So what are you looking for when you're doing this? Well, you have the patient's appearance, the child's appearance, and it's going to vary. It's going to depend upon the severity of the respiratory condition. Um, you know, a child with a mild respiratory distress might be compensating, right? They might have maybe elevated heart rate but otherwise appear normal to you, where the child with more severe dis type of disease going on might be alert and interactive, might be appearing very anxious. And then a child who is in respiratory failure might end up appearing, appearing very ill and have tachycardia, tachypnea, might have that elevated heart rate, um, it might be sweating, their eyelids might be a little you know, half closed, um, and pretty much looking at you with this look of sort of help me on their face, right? So a child with respiratory symptoms who is lethargic or unresponsive, this is the type of patient that ends up being very worrisome for us, right? And this is what's suggesting to us that a potential respiratory failure and maybe even a respiratory arrest might be uh, imminent for that patient, right? And also we want to look at the work of breathing for the child. Now the child might have an increased respiratory rate, increased respiratory effort, and abnormal airway and lung sounds. Maybe they're wheezing or grunting, things like that. Um, look for their head bobbing or that seesawing respirations you might have heard about. And these are all signs of severe distress and really can end up uh, leading to that rapid deterioration of the patient into that respiratory arrest, right? So as you're looking at the child, right, you were observing the child, you know, look if their breathing difficulty is seen during inspiratory and expiratory phases. Um, you know, a pediatric patient with an increased respiratory effort might have difficulty speaking even more than just a few words at a time. All right, and you look at an infant, we look looking at them for work of breathing. Um, their their increased respiratory effort may just sort of have like that weak cry going on, okay? So, you know, it's all about the assessment and looking at all the different sort of uh, uh, signs that you can look for. And this is just, again, this is just your quick initial uh, look and listening at the patient as you're walking up to them, as you're looking at them, right? Now, what about circulation? Well, it does play into breathing. You know, a child who has normal or even pale skin or, or, or even cyanosis, um, you might have a patient with, with uh, normal skin color. It's not really a reliable sign, right, that they're having uh, adequate oxygenation or that the, uh, that the oxygenation is, um, is, is uh, sufficient for them and their ventilatory rate is adequate, right? Now, cyanosis, um, especially if you talk about cyanosis around their nose, their mouth, this can really indicate severe hypoxemia to the patient. Now, visible cyanosis, where you talk about, you know, where the patient's requiring and, you know, really needs more concentration of that hemoglobin, so they need more oxygen, right? So you might not really see that in an anemic trial with, with, with hypoxemia, right? But you, what you need to do is to give them that high concentration of oxygen and even possibly assist ventilation. Okay, so look at that circulatory issue, see if they're cyanotic, um, you know, and depending upon if it's uh, around their nose, their mouth, their fingers, I mean, to me, either way, I think I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, go ahead and uh, uh, give them high concentration of oxygen, right, despite if they have a history of anemia or something like that. Now, real quick, I want to just talk about the primary assessment, guys, and 
this is just the sort of the airway breathing end of it. You know, if you do suspect a child, like we talked about, that's uh, in, in respiratory distress or possibly respiratory failure, um, you want to try to evaluate them and use your, you know, that primary assessment that we've all been taught. And what you want to do is partic pay a particular, you know, attention to things like their airway. You know, evaluate the airway for compromise. See if it's make sure it's clear or is it obstructed. Um, if it is obstructed, what are you going to hear or what are you going to observe for those types of patients? Increased respiratory effort, maybe retractions, um, inspiratory sound, those snoring or high pitched sound, that stridor going on. Um, maybe episodes of no airway sounds at all, despite their effort. Okay, things like severe upper respiratory obstruction. You might they, they might be um, having a a big effort, but you're hearing no uh, airway sounds at all, or maybe the inability to make any sound. And this, again, this is another sign of a severe airway obstruction going on. And then, of course, you have the patients that might have that copious amount of nasal or even oral secretion. So if you identify a patient um, that's got a mild or severe airway obstruction, try to figure out if you can maintain it with just simple simple measures, right? Uh, maybe positioning, maybe suctioning, um, and if that doesn't work, of course, you're going to have to consider things like advanced uh, interventions, advanced airway sort of control if you can't sort of manage it with uh, simple measures, right? Um, now, breathing, what you want to do, again, evaluate that breathing. Look for that ventilatory compromise. Look for the respiratory distress, respiratory failure, or signs of that imminent respiratory arrest. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And what about ventilatory compromise? Well, some of the signs you might see is that unequal or even absent breath sounds. Um, you get that asymmetric or diminished paradoxal uh, absent uh, expansion of the chest during um, inspiration, uh, decreased test, chest expansion. This can result from things uh, like an inadequate effort from the patient, the airway obstruction, um, pneumothorax, even a hemothorax, um, fluid in the lungs, a mucus plug, or again, we talk about the airway, even a foreign body uh, aspiration going on. Okay, now that paradoxal chest movement that I just mentioned, this a lot of times you can see this with upper airway obstruction and respiratory muscle weakness. Now, I know this is a lot here, guys, in this Monday Minutes. I'm trying to cover a lot here in this short time frame, but I'm, I'm hoping that these are some, some clues for you uh, when you're assessing patients um, to look out for these things, right? Um, because we all know pediatric patients, you know, they don't always present like an adult, right? So we have to keep an eye out for these types of things. Now, further on is ventilatory compromise. Um, if we have diminished distal air going in, right? We have that barely audible breath sound when you listen with your stethoscope, right? You can barely hear the sounds. Um, you know, this could be, uh, you know, when you, you're you not really hearing it um, when you when a patient's breathing in. Um, and a lot of times you're going to really see a poor effort on the patient as well. So not only going to have that uh, decrease in sounds when you're listening, the patient's not really going to be giving you a lot of effort when they're breathing in as well. And then you've got that at the other end of that, we have an increased respiratory effort where you get that those retractions, right? Those retractions uh, with that diminished air entry that you're going to be, you know, not being able to hear. Okay, and this can be things like, uh, you know, again, things like uh, airflow obstruction, asthma, things like that, or even uh, lung tissue disease. Now, real quick, I just want to go over the imminent respiratory arrest part of this, guys, because this is something I think is important to sort of look out for, right? Because we put all the other things together. Um, a lot of patients will compromise just fine and, you know, we'll be fine with them to the hospital with a simple non-rebreather. Again, positioning, suctioning, things like that. But when we talk about imminent arrest, you need to evaluate and, and look for signs like, uh, you know, a slow br breathing rate, uh, periods of apnea, um, you know, the heart rate that end up falling, becoming bradycardic. Uh, diminished air movement that we talked about, low uh, SpO2, uh, the patient maybe being sort of in a stupor, um, it's poor skeletal tone, things like that. And of course, we mentioned early on that cyanosis being a sign of, of uh, imminent arrest. We have the circulatory system collapsing as well. So always evaluate the patient when we talk about respiratory rate 
and a lot of you know when you look at that along with a lot of other clinical findings you know re, a decreased rate, respiratory rate from from a rapid to a normal rate could show that the patient's improving by what you're doing right but if you if someone is accompanied by things like a mental status that's getting better um and reduce signs of them actually having uh, difficulty breathing. And of course, we can see that when we look at our patient. If we're assessing our patient over and over again like we should be, we're going to notice that positive improvement. But if we see a patient who's decreasing uh, or irregular respiratory rate in a child um, with a deteriorating le level of consciousness, um, that's going to indicate that the patient is, is deteriorating on us, might be going to imminent respiratory arrest. So just because one minute they're breathing fast and then they start slowing down doesn't always mean they're getting better. Uh, it, can, it can indicate that you've got an issue going on as far as uh, that they're going into respiratory arrest. So we have to of course, monitor not just respiratory rate, but also their mental status and their circulatory rate as well and, and title, you know, their um, SpO2 and all that. So all things we have to sort of look at, and this is all pretty much, if you think about it, just on our initial assessment. We haven't even gone into a lot of things like lung sounds and, and further circulatory assessment and things like that. So there's a lot of things to sort of to look at and put together, and this should be an ongoing assessment. It should be something we're doing all the time when we're encountering these patients, right? Don't take for granted that they're compensating one way and maybe we're not catching it, and then the next thing you know, they're going into a vent ventilatory compromise and then into an, a respiratory arrest situation. Guys, listen, this, again, quick Monday Minutes here. If you really want to try to get some more uh, information on pediatrics and assessment, um, I suggest this webinar I did here with Greg Fries on pediatric assessment essentials. And um, what Greg did, he discussed a lot of things like uh, vital patient assessment techniques, um, the role that we play as EMS providers uh, with injury prevention with children, um, and even we talked a little bit about performing procedures as well. You know, Greg covered things like pediatric prevention and the role of us again like we talked about um getting that general impression like i've talked a lot a little bit about today things like that toe to head assessment is versus the head to toe assessment um and these can be key components to your initial assessment uh age appropriate communication vital signs pain recognition um all great topics and and uh you know that greg covered during this webinar so great content then if you sign up for this webinar and and watch it you're going to get the video the audio for it um you'll get the uh any of the show notes that will happen from from this webinar um including a text version of, of the session, any links that Greg mentioned, any resources that were mentioned, and there's also a pediatric resource guide that's included as well as part of as the downloads for um, this webinar also. And this, this uh, resource guide has some, some pretty cool safety tips, assessment tips, and some more links, I think, that are going to help you a lot with your interaction with pediatric patients. Um, some other little goodies there too, guys, that you can see on the page, uh, a little pain assessment report from uh, Jamie Davis at the Metacast. Um, great stuff here, guys. Uh, this webinar that we did, um, go check it out. The link is right here below uh, the the notes here, and you can it's also below in the in the uh, the notes of the video as well. So that's it for this Monday minutes, guys. I know it's a little bit longer than usual, but I want to be able to cover as much as I can in a limited time, and hopefully direct you on the right path when you're doing that quick look and listen of your patient, your pediatric patient, when you first approach them to give you a quick general impression on um, whether you need to be, you know, rapidly getting getting along and getting that patient going to the hospital or if you can stay on scene and try to do a little bit more history taking and figure out what's going on with the patient. So um, any comments or questions you have, guys, of course, send them over to me. It's Jay Hoffman at emsofficehours.com. And I will talk to you next week. And as always, guys, Jim Hoffman, stay safe. Thank you.